This is part 7 of my American road trip series, in which I'm narrating one scary story from every US state. Be sure to check out all the other episodes in the series after this. Don't worry, they're not in any particular order. Thank you to everyone who sent in their stories so far. Now, get ready as we continue on down Route 666. It was summer in small town New Mexico. I was about 15 years old at the time, and since school was out, I was doing a few odd jobs around town to earn some money. Mowing lawns, walking dogs, anything that could make me a few bucks, you know. There was this one guy who lived in my town, an older gentleman in his early 70s, Mr. Lesnar. He used to be a teacher at my school, but I hadn't seen him for at least a year. He was bald, with a big white beard. Put a red suit on the guy and he could have passed as a mall Santa. I always remembered him as being a nice, friendly guy, so when I bumped into him in town, I asked if there was anything he needed help with. He said there was. He needed help reorganizing a few parts of his house, said that he'd pay me 50 bucks if I helped him. When you're 15 years old, having $50 in your pocket feels like being a millionaire. I took him up on it. The next day rolled around, and I went over to Mr. Lesnar's house and knocked on the door. He answered with a smile on his face and invited me inside. First thing that struck me was the stench. His house had that old person smell about it. I didn't know much about the guy to be honest. I mean, yeah, he used to teach at my school, but all I really remembered about him was how he always wore socks with sandals, and how he always spent every school vacation down in Mexico. I started off by cleaning up in the kitchen. Once I'd finished, Mr. Lesnar told me that he wanted help boxing up some things in the basement. Said he had too much junk down there, and that he wanted to reorganize and get rid of a load of it. Told me to start boxing things up, and to come and tell him when I'd finished. There must have been a set of twelve stairs that led down into this strangely large, stale-smelling basement. Mr. Lesnar flicked the light switch. Alone dusty light bulb illuminated the basement. I grabbed a few folded up cardboard boxes and made my way down. So, there I was, just boxing all sorts of things up in this grungy basement. Must have spent about 45 minutes down there by myself. While I was working, I happened to lean against a particular spot on the wall. When I leant on it, I came across something odd. A loose panel in the basement wall. Not a broken part of the wall, mind you. I mean, this panel was intentionally loose. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I started fumbling with it. It came right off. Behind the panel was a small compartment. Hidden inside that compartment was a box. It felt like finding a hidden treasure chest. I checked to see if Mr. Lesnar was standing behind me at the top of the stairs. The coast was clear. I knew I probably shouldn't, but I pulled out the box. I lifted off the top, curious to see what the old man was hiding inside. At first, it didn't look like there was much in it. A journal, a few knickknacks, and a small pile of photographs, maybe ten or twelve in total. I took out the photos. My heart immediately sank after looking at the top one. At first, I could hardly believe the image. It showed Mr. Lesnar with a pistol in his hand, kneeling down next to a dead woman lying in the dirt. Her lifeless eyes were staring into the camera lens. She was clearly Mexican, and had obviously been shot. The second photo was almost identical, only this time it was a male who stared lifelessly at the camera. No, no, this can't be real, I thought. I flicked through all the pictures, every damn one each one telling the same story. They all showed Lesnar, knelt down next to some bloody, human game, sprawled out on the ground in front of him. All of the victims varied wildly in age. There was writing on the backs of all the photos, but it was all in Spanish, and I couldn't make it out. Still, I knew instantly what this was. A box full of sick mementos from Lesnar's trips to Mexico hidden away from the world in a small wall compartment. In some photos, Lesnar looked younger, 
In others, he appeared to be in his mid-sixties. In all of them, he was kneeling down next to his victims, with the same disturbing grin on his face, posing like a hunter with his trophies. I was overcome by this weird mixture of shock, disgust, anger, and most of all, fear. Fear that I was in the basement of the monster in these photos. Without thinking, I shoved the images back inside the box and slid the container back into the wall. I desperately fumbled with the wall panel, trying to put it back in the exact same way it was, not wanting the old man to realize that I'd discovered his horrible secret. I just about got the damn thing back in place when I heard a creaking at the top of the basement stairs behind me. I turned to see old man Lesnar standing by the basement door, looking down at me. I have never felt more like a rat in a cage. Looks like you're doing a good job, he said. My heart skipped a beat. I just mumbled something and tried to act like nothing was wrong. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just going upstairs for a nap. You keep on going down there. With that, he slowly turned and walked off through the hallway. There was maybe twenty seconds of silence before I heard his footsteps making their way up the stairs to his bedroom. My mind was racing. Had he seen me fiddling with the panel? Did he know that I'd found his photos? Oh god, was I in danger? I was only a scrawny kid. I decided not to stay down there wondering. I waited for a few moments before bolting up the basement staircase. I dashed towards the front door, grabbed the handle and twisted. No good. The damn thing had been locked from the inside. I figured the old man had just locked it before he went upstairs. I scanned the door to see if there was a way to quickly open it. No time. I could hear movements above me. The old man was walking back out of his bedroom and towards the stairs. I sprinted through the hallway and into the kitchen. I knew from the cleaning earlier there was a back door there. I grabbed the handle and prayed. With a twist, it flung open. It felt like winning the lottery. I flew out of that house, ran around the property and back onto the main street. I looked back only once. When I did, I saw the old man's face in one of the downstairs windows. He looked to be holding something. I was too far away to make out what it was exactly, but I bet you can guess what I thought it was. From there, I kept on running until I got home, thankful that the old man lived in a cul-de-sac and not in the middle of nowhere. If he did, I'm certain he'd have taken a shot at me. It goes without saying that I told my parents what I'd found. We notified the authorities about it, and I told them about the secret panel and the sick mementos in the box. When they checked the place out, they did indeed find the secret compartment. Predictably, it was totally empty. There was no box hidden inside, no evidence of any wrongdoing whatsoever. They figured I was just messing with the old guy or something, and decided not to look into him any further. I don't know what Lesnar did with the pictures, whether he destroyed them or hid them elsewhere but he got away with it all regardless. Old man Lesnar lived another eight years after that. In that time, I graduated high school, went off to college, and moved out of town. My parents always lived in that same place, however. For all the time I lived there after that incident, and whenever I'd go back to visit my parents, I'd always be looking over my shoulder. I knew that Mr. Lesnar wanted to take his secret to the grave and I always worried that he'd try and silence me to do so. It's hard to believe there are people like this, who, to the outside world, are leading seemingly ordinary lives. I'm glad I didn't become his last trophy. This next entry actually comes from one of my earliest videos, but I've always considered it to be one of my favourite stories, and I've wanted to redo it for a long time. Here it goes. During the midsummer, usually around the middle of July, me and a few of my good friends, Ryan, Kevin and Tommy, always made time to go up to Kev's family cabin, located on Vermilion Lake, way up north in the forests of Minnesota. Throughout all of our young years, we would always be accompanied by Kevin's dad, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. 
Once we were juniors in high school, however, we felt mature enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. My friend's cabin was very remote and very little, based upon a large island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid half mile away at least, and you could only get to it by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. Vermilion Lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run around while I was sleeping there. The cabin was all on one level, with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and living room area connected to them, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. There was always one window in each of the rooms with no curtains to them at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would run, as I always thought about someone peering in. And they never were, of course. I had been to the cabin about a dozen times during my lifespan, and nothing bad ever happened there. So the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On this particular trip, we planned to stay around five nights. On the third night during the trip, when we were finally on our own, we had set up a campfire and had been drinking beers all night. I don't condone underage drinking, but being the rebels we were, we just so happened to sneak some. We went out to the dock to stare up at the magnificent stars and enjoy our buzz, when all of a sudden, we heard something out on the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked over at the lake, wondering where the splash came from, our fishing poles at the ready. Thankfully, the moon was out that night, which lit up the lake. Without it, it would have been pitch black, what with there being no city lights for miles upon miles. Ryan began to point out to something. Um, guys, what the hell's that? After looking closely, and finally spotting what he was pointing at, the only way I can describe it is it simply looked like a head floating out in the middle of the lake, staring at us directly. It was about three quarters worth of a football field out in the lake from the dock. It had long, black hair, and a very pale, skin-like face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose, or chin, as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget that feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck, and arms all stood up, and I felt paralyzed on the inside and ready to go home at that moment. We told ourselves it was just a loon. Those birds are very popular night drifters on the lake, and they do their hunting late. I mean, it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting for a bit. Or at least, we tried to convince ourselves of that scenario. All of us had the creeps. That damn thing wasn't moving one bit, just treading water in the same place. We went back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. We soon forgot about the head-like thing with the help of the beer. That is, until I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was preoccupied. I went outside to do my business, seeing how we were in the great outdoors. Whilst taking a pee and glancing at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black, circular object was still there, but about thirty yards closer now, still looking as if it was staring right up at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me, and I immediately went back inside and told my friends to come and look. They all came outside to see it still there, looking at us as if the head was corked up and its chin was in the air. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore, and we immediately went back inside, deciding it probably wasn't a loon. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us from the deck. And there was no ripple effect from it at all. We said it was just a log and went back inside. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy, too. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point, and we all knew we needed sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside one last time, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, 
thinking the log must have floated off or just hit shore somewhere else. There was no AC in the cabin, and we had to open the windows, or else we'd fry in the middle of summer. Me and Tommy slept in the living room, while my two other friends slept in the two bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. No question that whoever or whatever I heard down there was on the deck, pacing back and forth, their feet clicking on the wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. I wanted to whisper to my buddy, but was frozen in fear. I just kept my eyes shut and my ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two rapid steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting away down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy and asked him if he'd heard the steps. We both sat up and were startled by Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now. There was something very disturbing about his expression. I asked him why. He woke up Kevin in the other room. Come on, get to the boat. It's time to go. What? Ryan, what the hell's wrong with you? Kevin asked. Ryan explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. I'll never forget what he told us, nor will my other friends. He said that when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable, he saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of the window. The figure quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and long black hair down the window. When looking back at what he experienced, it chills us to the bone to realize that since this face was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room, it was either damn near eight foot tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in, or was floating. Tommy and I told the others what we had heard outside the cabin, absolutely disturbed the hell out of our minds and feeling like we were going to be sick. We all packed up our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw bare footprints in the dirt, heading off along the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, made it to the boat, not knowing what was watching us or around us, threw our stuff in the boat, untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water. My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving. I saw nothing. When we finally got our stuff packed in the car, we hopped inside and took off. We drove for about ten miles, when, out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car, sobbing, saying things like, What was it, guys? What was it? Oh god, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what had happened on the way back, told them that Ryan was freaking out. They said to just get home safely and quickly. It was late, about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend. Said he didn't experience anything weird while there, but did mention that the bare footprints were still lingering about. That bugged him badly. What Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping for multiple nights and ended up having to seek help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine, but isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. To this day, I can't explain what happened, nor why it seemed to happen to us. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, so we're told by Kevin's dad at least. I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad, because I have some great childhood memories from there. Tommy and Kevin have both been back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to ever set foot there again, and I'm with him. A lot of people have cabins on that island, so it could have been a prank in the making, and Ryan busted it when he saw the person in the window. It could also have been a person wanting to do something worse to us. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that that incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan, all happened in the same night, 
seems like more than a coincidence to me. I was out hiking in Morgan Monroe State Forest with my girlfriend one afternoon. It was a nice day, and the insects and birds were chirping away. Out of nowhere, the pair of us heard what sounded like three gunshots, one after another. They went off not too far down the trail. We looked at each other. A few seconds of silence. Then another three shots. Is that gunfire? My girlfriend asked me. I nodded, unable to think what else it could be out here. We decided to turn back, not wanting to chance running into some hillbilly nutjob or whatever. What struck me at that moment was the lack of any kind of sound coming from the woods. After the shots rang out, there wasn't any kind of nature sound at all. I mean, I get that the birds might have been scared away, but even the insects had fallen silent. We were both getting some weird vibes. The situation just felt unnatural. In amongst all the surreal silence, we heard one thing just behind us. Footsteps snapping on twigs. We turned to see who was following us. I half expected to see a hunter with a rifle. I was wrong. Moving down the trail towards us was this thing. A humanoid figure that obviously wasn't human. It was like looking at a living silhouette. Even in the light, it looked like it was hiding in the darkness. The thing just looked like a shadow. That's the best way I can describe it. The sunlight just wasn't hitting it for some reason. From its outline, it looked to just be skin and bones. And it was tall. Real tall. At least a foot larger than me, and I'm not a small dude. I'd scarcely believe I'd even seen the thing had my girlfriend not been there as well. It was walking in long strides, gaining a lot of distance with each step. Needless to say, we bolted back the way we came. I have no idea if that thing pursued us or not. We were both too terrified to turn back and look. We made it back to our vehicle and hightailed it home, not stopping for anything. We've never been back to Morgan Monroe since. Unless the both of us momentarily lost our minds at the exact same time, then there's something out in those woods, and neither of us plan on going back to find out what it is. So, near where I live, but a little farther out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Rube Hill. It runs maybe three miles long, and only half a mile of it's paved. On the south end is the pavement, with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotted around it. Deceptively average at that point. Then the houses end, the pavement ends, and the gravel road shoots up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel's piled up in potholes and berms. So, unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you'd want to take it easy. Since you'd need to drive slowly, you'd get a nice view of the handmade signs nailed to trees with messages like, No Trespassing, and We're Watching You, scrawled in Sharpie. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before diving back down the other side of the hill. The gravel is in equally crappy condition on this side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straight for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason I'm so familiar with the layout is that I've taken friends out on late night drives along this road to scare the bejesus out of them. Never an elaborate prank, I'd just drive slowly and play creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always made sure to tell them about the meth heads and their labs out there, and how the sheriffs try to avoid going there because it's dangerous. I figured it was all hogwash. Just stories, you know. But now I think there's an element of truth to some of those rumours. I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go on a late night drive along Rube Hill to freak ourselves out. 
We took off, drove down the various country highways and backroads, and turned onto Rue Pill. I made sure to play extra creepy music, since Aaron and I had made the trip many times before. It honestly lost a lot of its creepy luster on me, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, the drive mostly went by uneventful, and we were almost across the hill, about to descend the other side. That's when Aaron started freaking out. I checked my mirrors to see what had spooked him so much, and saw track headlights down the road behind us. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck made it under the only street light on the top of the hill, a really dim orange light, and I could see it was kicking up a ton of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music we were playing, and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind that I've driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night and not once have I ever encountered another vehicle. So, having a truck speeding to seemingly catch up to us at midnight on a road supposedly filled with rumoured junkheads was pretty jarring. Usually, I don't relinquish my brakes driving down that hill. This time, I didn't even touch them. Thankfully, we got home safe and sound. The next day, I'm hanging out with one of my other friends, Chris. Chris and I are lounging around, playing video games, talking about quantum physics, Chris's favourite thing, and Chipotle, my favourite thing. I of course told him about Aaron and I being chased, and I kind of hammed it up, made it come across more harrowing than it really was. Now Chris wanted to go to the road, so we waited until late at night, about 2am, and drove out to Rube Hill. This time I wasn't playing any music. I wanted to be alert. It was all going quite normally, just like usual, when I slammed on my brakes. I threw the car in park and turned to Chris. Oh, dude, you can see that too, right? Chris was just as confused as me. He looked at me and nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road in front of us. On the right, it was wrapped around a tree at roughly head height for an adult and it was pulled taut across the road, anchored to a fence post on the left at roughly chest height. We were both sitting there, wondering what to make of it, when we heard gravel being thrown by tyres behind us. I checked my mirrors, and sure enough, truck headlights were tearing ass down the road. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control, and I began sweating. Chris just swore quietly under his breath. I threw it into drive, pulled as far to the right as I could, and my low-sitting car slid under the cable with a loud metal-on-metal -metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard the scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliveranced. So again, I flew down the hill, and this is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right, past Chris and briefly caught a glimpse of somebody standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up, and I floored the accelerator. I glanced in my rearview mirror, and could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulder. I couldn't tell if it was a cane, or maybe a rifle, but I didn't stay to find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around a bend and out of sight. That car had a scrape mark on the roof the rest of the time I owned it. It was a good reminder of why I never went out to that road again. In the middle of summer last year, my best friend Roberto and I went hiking in the woods in the Richmond area of Virginia. We got up before sunrise and packed our backpacks with food, water and energy drinks. He was training to go into the Marine Corps, so this was one of many exercises I did alongside him to help him get in shape. We got to the state park right at sunrise and were the first ones there. Our goal that day was to hike 14 miles from one trailhead to the other 
so we dropped his car off at the far trailhead, and parked mine at the trailhead that we began at. The sun was already up by the time we got moving along the dirt trail that hugged the banks of the lake. Even under the shade of the canopy, it was still brutally hot and humid. We were drenched in sweat by the time we reached the mile mark. Aside from the humidity, it was a great hike. That is, until we reached mile nine and saw this middle-aged white woman holding a small dog in her arms, standing in the middle of the trail ahead of us. Roberto turned off his Bluetooth speaker, and we could hear that the lady was crying. She noticed we were there, and began walking briskly back towards us. Please wait, I really need help. We could see that she was soaked in sweat, and had obviously been crying for a while. Please help me, I'm lost, and it's so hot out here. Her poor little dog was panting like crazy, and I noticed she didn't have any supplies with her. I pulled out my water bottle and began pouring some onto a leaf. The little dog drank it immediately. I offered the woman some of the water as well, but she politely refused. After talking with her for a couple of minutes, she told us that she had parked her vehicle on the other side of the trail from where we had started, and that she had walked for only a mile. We told her that she was about five miles away from where she claimed to have started. She kept repeating that she was too tired to keep walking, and that she was worried for her dog. Roberto pulled out his cell phone and called the ranger station. He explained the situation and our location to the ranger who answered, and the ranger said that they would come by boat and pick her and her dog up. We walked towards the bank of the lake to wait for them. This is where things started getting weird. The lady's exhausted demeanor vanished, and she became very animated. She was saying that she was so thankful for our help, and that she wanted to repay us. We told her that was unnecessary, and were just glad that we could help her out. She then asked if she could give us a hug. I told her sure, just to be nice. It was strange, and I did get a weird vibe from her, yet I didn't want to be rude. Roberto on the other hand told her no and used the excuse that he was too sweaty for hugs. That's when the lady's good mood came to a screeching halt. You'd have thought that he cussed her out or something. She stopped talking, and just stared at him with this sinister look. Then she began talking solely to her dog, saying things like, Don't say another word to them. We don't like them anymore. Roberto and I just looked at each other, a little freaked out. We could see the small motor-powered chum boat approaching with two rangers in it. We waved them down and waited in silence until they pulled up along the shoreline. The lady walked towards them and handed them her dog, then turned around and gave us the most evil look imaginable. The park rangers helped her into the boat and waved goodbye to us. She just sat with her back to us as they began gliding along the water towards the entrance that she parked at. Roberto and I laughed it off. Like, what a weirdo, we thought. We helped her and were nothing but nice to her, and she gets all mad at us for Roberto not giving her a hug? Unbelievable. We finished our five remaining miles, and arrived at Roberto's car in the parking lot. When we got close to his car, we could see that there were dents all over the hood that weren't there before. He began running towards his car, enraged, when, from behind a picnic area, that lady we helped earlier appeared. She came running at Roberto with a goddamn hammer in her hand. She got right up close to him and started swinging. Luckily, she missed, and he caused her to trip when he moved to avoid her. We then held her down and called 911. When the cops arrived, she started yelling about how we were hurting her and told them to shoot us. They came over and took her away. We had to write up incident reports for the cops and recount everything that happened. As it turns out, this woman had broken into her ex-husband's new family's apartment and stolen their dog the night before. The crazy part is, one of the cops responding to the situation said it was his cousin, and that she had just posted a video of us on Facebook Live while we were walking back to Roberto's truck. In the live video, she was whispering repeatedly, I'm gonna kill them. Her ex-husband saw the Facebook Live video and called the cops on her that very moment. The cop said she used to be a normal lady who worked in the school system, until she snapped and became this demon-like person.
Hey guys, Lizzie here, and thank you very much for listening. A huge shout out to Anthony Salinas for making the thumbnail for this video. Make sure to check him out via the links in the description down below. Tell him Lazy sent ya. So yeah, I totally forgot to celebrate my fourth year anniversary on YouTube, so no fireworks this year unfortunately, but um, maybe I can think of a special topic for the next video, who knows. If you have any ideas, let me know. As always, a huge shout out to my supporters on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Anime Wimp Crazy Mask Parade James Labour John Crouch Procupidine Netta Gina Valera Philip Westra Alex Greensaw Monica Mendoza Sion of the Emperor Crawford K. MacDonald Marley Wright Ray Price Burton Nadine Charles Wilson Mitchell Allen Herrera Sloan Crawford Andrew Romans Samuel Cotton Kat Mayers Sarah Ramirez Victor Javier Fonseca Ruiz and Maracruz Cadano. Thank you very much guys, a huge salute to all of you. If you'd like to support me as well, you can find a link to my Patreon page down in the description. Well that about wraps it up for part 7 guys, I'll be back again with part 8 very soon. But until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.